round two. Great. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to have the chance to talk about some of this material today. Um, it, it doesn't come lightly. I, I understand the opportunity cost and weigh it heavily when I'm triaging here. Um, but since we've reached this critical tipping point, as it were, this critical um, critical point where we where we have enough of a repertoire, we can cover some key areas for our work and uh, related areas in health modeling. Um, I, I felt um, there were a couple of topics I just had to hit. And last time, as you know, I hit on um, exponential objects and went on to, to talk about product categories and monoidal categories as well. And I used that as a springboard for another area of great programming significance, which is output data. By the way, can be on board here is another area to explore uh, for projects. But uh, today, I I wanted to ride yet further um, in these kind of eccentric topics for chapter nineteen, and specifically, I wanted to talk about this area that has enormous implications for our work and for modeling and for graphical languages such as we use, which is an area called symmetric minority categories. And I recommended viewing a video by John Boss, um on symmetric minority categories. And in uh, that video, better than any other I know, um, you know, highlights the um, the ubiquity of diagrams within science and science and engineering. And the observation from that video um, is that many of these diagrams, particularly diagrams which are compositional, which where you can compose diagrams, stick electrical circuits together, stick stock flow diagrams together, stick Petri nets together, compose agent-based models. Uh, with uh, logic, logic can be illustrated with some diagrams, um, you know, uh, Bayesian uh, machine learning and statistics has plate diagrams. There's all these different diagrams in science and when they have enough structure to them and, and they support um, composition and associativity, et cetera, um, in many cases, they end up being described very um, elegantly as these things called symmetric normal categories. And that's, that's quite a mouthful, but um, uh, it turns out it, it, it has a certain, um, uh, certain centrality in, uh, in, in science uh, as it relates to these diagrams. And I'd like to, I'd like to go through and, and help communicate why symmetric monoidal categories um, have, have this just wonderful relationship to diagrams and the ways in which they uh, uh, they Render moot um, a lot of visual ambiguities, so that we can look at a diagram without without getting all worried if it's going to be misunderstood in some regards, or without worrying about distinctions of no significance, visual sort of parsing of a bit of no significance. Uh, so maybe someone who's uh, on the Zoom channel right now can just confirm you can see the slides. Okay. Okay, so yes. um, awesome. Huh? Okay, well, we saw the slides, but but it's waiting for Google, it says, um, for docs.google.com. Okay, but uh, while, while it's trying to, trying mightily to, to, to see these slides, um, uh, I'll just note that uh, I'm gonna show you just one side of symmetric monodal 
categories as illustrated with diagrams and recognize that you'll see many other particular cases. So it turns out that stock flow is underlain by symmetric minimal categories. Uh, and it turns out that that uh, polynomial functors, we're going to see symmetric monoidal categories come up there um, in sort of block diagram form. And I hope that to show you some reasons um, why diagrams are such a wonderful way of illustrating um, uh, formulations, uh, mathematical formulations with, with symmetric categories. So, um, in a way, they, they formalize our ability to reason visually um, for many types of diagrams, particularly with respect to both serial and parallel arrangements. Arrangements where we have things um, uh, sort of end to end and where we have them next to each other, but in parallel, not um, with one not purely feeding into the other or vice versa. Um, and one of the most powerful features that I'll come back to is because these are based on the firm foundation of a symmetric monoidal category. Um, the, and because the, the, the sort of tensoring, the, the, the way of combining things in parallel honors composition, I know that's quite a mouthful, but um, but remember, we talked about functors honoring composition, that if we, we either take two morphisms and compose them and then map them over, we get the same thing as mapping over those things and then composing. Remember that idea? Well, it turns out that, that the functor that captures monoidal operations, it's kind of funny looking operation we call tensor, that honors composition. And it turns out that. One of the things that that means is that visual ambiguities, different ways of looking at the same diagram and saying, hmm, is it this or is it this, are irrelevant. They're moved. They're, they're, um, there's no distinction okay, um, between those. They are by definition, by construction, the same. And this means you can just read the diagrams in a very natural way without worrying about um, needless distinctions. Uh, and it turns out wiring diagrams constitute morphisms in a certain category, particularly when they represent open systems. We take one open system, we can compose it with another, compose it with another by sticking them end to end, sticking them next to each other. And, and these end up being morphisms often between these, these sort of uh, things representing their interfaces. And we can also compose these in a nested sort of way. Um, we're going to see less of that now. We're going to see more of it in the polynomial function context as we explore that later outside the scope of this course. So I want to, to motivate this, like John Weisdos in his talk, I, I wanted to just reflect a little bit on composition. Um, and you may remember that uh, when we had not categories, but before that, we explored monoids as a category. Do you remember that? We had one object, right? And where were the elements of this monoid? Where were those elements found? The morphisms. The morphisms are the elements. Do you remember that? And, you know, we said, like, okay, you got one, and then if you compose it with two, you, you get the minoidal operation between it. It's like one plus two, right? Remember that? So I'm going to appeal to you roughly, you know, that we could think of this, we could think of a sequence of these things as adding successive things. We add, we add one, and we have point one, we, we add two to it, and then maybe we add four, and then we add three. And we could write that out informally in a kind of wiring diagram way, in a way that might be familiar to those of us from engineering background, right? Where there's some number, we add two to it, and we get another number, we add three to it. And these blocks are kind of, you know, uh, blocks that perform some function, right? I think some of us from engineering diagram will have seen cases where these blocks are, you know, uh, uh, 
elements in an electrical circuit, or or they could be flip flops, or they could be associated with, you know, a um, uh, component just for with microcontrollers or an ALU, an arithmetic log logic unit, whatever. But what I want to highlight to you um, is something John also highlighted with this sort of idea of composition. Composition defines these serial structures. By serial, uh, I'm not referring to grains, but just sort of successive successive end-to-end -end chaining of them. So one picks up where the, the other left off. Right. So if we start with zero and you add two to it, you add three to it. And and we do that by sort of we can do this by composing successively these modes. Right? So so we have one and we add two, we get three and add three again, we get six, and then maybe get two, we get eight, and and so on with with composition. As leading to sort of the successive, um, uh, successive uh, steps of elaboration. Um, so the wiring diagram can be used to illustrate this sort of successive composition here that gives larger numbers uh, over time. Do Do you appreciate that? And what I want to highlight is is a basic way in which, while there's ambiguity here. Someone could be excused for saying, well, wait a minute, I don't, I, I don't know what this means. You know, does it mean we do two and then three and then you know plus two, plus three, plus one, and then plus four? Or is it instead we're doing plus two and then we're doing plus three plus one plus four after it? Like I, I don't know how it how it kind of groups. Um, I don't know, like, do I have to do uh, you know, can I think about bigger chunks of it together? And particularly, you know, we have uh, this question of by the two and then you know plus two and and plus plus two plus three and then plus one is it the same as plus two and then plus three plus one, right? And what what um, compositionality? Excuse me. What the properties of ca basic categories tell us is what do we have to worry about that? With with comp composition of arrows, do we have to worry? You know, is it this? You know, uh, uh, is it different if we do one here and then two and three uh, on top that compose them successfully, or is it is it different from do one two and, and then three? No, they're guaranteed to be the same because because of associativity. Remember this notion of associativity we've had from the get go, and I've often. Use the glib comment, um, uh, which you know uh, maybe something that David Spivak said, or Brendan Fong, or 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 uh, Bartosz Mielewski, others of my mentors. You know they they said uh, uh, other teachers I've had for this. You know it, it doesn't matter what the parentheses. Are. You don't have to worry about the parentheses. What I want to highlight for you though is that when you look at that diagram, you don't have to worry about. It. And you might say it's ambiguous, but it's ambiguous in a way that's irrelevant. Like whether you think of it as chunks and then something later, or, you know, the first thing and then the chunk later, it doesn't matter. It, it's all the same. So we don't have to worry that it's ambiguous. We don't have to worry it could be read in different ways because they all give the same answer. Right? Um, no matter where we group it, whatever our preference, whatever way that strikes us as intuitive, it works and it's the same. It commutes, it's the same. Are we okay with that notion? Okay, so with that basic sort of um, point of reference in minds, this basic, more than a metaphor, but this, you know, um, thing we can come from the point, <laughs> point of reference. We can come from. Um, I want to, I want to hit on now how we go beyond this. This is for composition alone, and we have this ability to serially compose things. And we're going to mix into this something that's been the topic of much of our discussion in recent weeks, which is monoidal structure. And one of the things we talked about in this classroom was once you have product and once you have co-product, 
you have the emergence of monoidal structure. You have the more uh, the ability to combine A and B, an object A and object B to get their product. Remember that? Or to get their code file. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here, it's desirable to use a functor. I, I argued the last time to express this monoidal structure in general. We have co-product, product, and you know, for these cases and for others, it's nice to generalize it and have this way of expressing it more generally. So whether we're doing co-product, product, we can reason about a, uh, a monoidal structure. Okay. Um, and and the idea here is we'll map up, we'll, we'll map you know a pair of objects, say A and B, in a source category to an object that represents the combination of them in a monoidal operation. So we'll have A and a B, and we'll map them over with this functor into some target object over in this other category that's A cross B. It's just a label for what the target is. I mean, it's, it's some target. We call it A, a cross B. We call it A cross B. Are we okay with this? So we went through this before, but I just want to rehearse this in our mind, you know, reflect on it in our mind. Um, and the way we did this, and I hope it wasn't too confusing, is we introduced this notion of product category. Why did we do that? Because we didn't want to have to create a whole new beast of a functor that takes two separate things very, very specifically. We define this product category. And you remember we could take a product of two things here. Let's just sort of see with C cross D. We could have had C and D, but the idea is that the product category had pairs of objects from the source category. Do you remember that? Um, just on the way to defining the Minona functor, just, just when first define a product category, that's how we get our pairs of things that we're going to map over with the Minona the Minona product functor. Mm -hmm. This, this. So I, I want to define how we're going to get these pairs as we're constructing a uh, product category. And remember, we have pairs, product categories, pairs of objects in the source category, which happen to here be from the same source category, category C. So we have like an A cross C. Remember that? And map morphisms. And, and morphisms we map over. Do you remember if we have this product between two things, under what conditions, say between A and C, under what conditions would there be a morphism to another one, B cross C? It, it, there would be a morphism if what? If A has a morphism that maps to B, and C has a morphism that maps to B. Exactly. So, so C, if A maps to B and C is morphism that maps to D, then you have a, a, a pair of that morphism, of those morphisms. That's right. And the argument I gave here is, gosh, you have a, you know, th this is true when you map between products even within a category, right? If we have a mapping from X to A, we have a mapping from Y to B, then we automatically have a mapping from X cross Y to X uh, to A cross B. And it just, it, it works here too, okay? Um, so it's the same idea we have even within a category, okay? Um, and I noted there's a thing called bi-map, which, which is, okay. So based on this last time, okay, so we have this ability to create these pairs that we're going to want to map over with this monoidal. So, and this is a bi functor, it's called. It takes this product category and, and sort of maps it over, right? Um, and so it maps pairs of objects uh, in a product category into a single object in the destination category called C tensor D. Are we okay? Yeah. And don't be worried, it's the weird. It's a tensor and linear algebra and vector spaces. Don't worry about that. No, it's it's just it's just a name for it. Could be plus. It could be times. Right. Um. It could be different monodal operations. Mm -hmm. Um. We do it a lot with times and plus. Mm -hmm. And pairs of morphisms here are mapped into uh, a, a single 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 morphism, or, or I should say, there's a morphism in C cross D that's mapped to a single morphism in. And, and C tensor D to C prime tensor D prime. So it says pairs of morphisms and well, yeah, it's a you know it's a, it's a pair of morphisms. You can think of this as a pair of morphisms if you want the, the F cross G 
Um, and right now we're focusing on blood functors from C cross C into, into to the same sort of uh, original uh, category. I'm the case of the components of the product category. Um, okay, so blood functors are like functors uh, in the sense they're structure preserving mappings, but they operate on these these pairs in the product category. Are, are we okay with that? Um, so I, I know it's and, and we have this, you know, uh, thing to construct as a functor, and then we have this, this bifunctor. But anyway, uh, sorry, we have this product category with this bifunctor that maps it over into a, to, to a category. So we can map like A cross C. Remember that one we paid attention to before? It goes over to A tensor C. Mm -hmm. And the morphism from A cross C to B cross D. It goes to this morphism from A tensor C to A to B tensor D. And, and don't be too worried about this being some weird object. I mean, it, 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 this could be A plus C, right? And, and that's the co-product. Maybe in C, they have a co-product. This is a way of saying that basically we're mapping each object onto its uh, a pair of objects onto their co-product, right? It's a way of finding the co-product specifying the co-product of two objects, so the product of two objects. Okay, so this is, uh, remember, remember we saw this before with monodal cadets. We still haven't gotten to our final thing, just just bringing this back, bring this idea back, okay. Um, and <laughs> one of the key things I wanna emphasize is, is I wanna emphasize the functoriality, I wanna, I want to emphasize here how the this bifunctor honors composition. So it's a functor. And I said earlier, remember how functors honor composition. Do you remember that? What does it what does it mean? I, I said it earlier for regular functor, but what does it mean that the bifunctor honors composition? Can anyone say roughly? Map to Cato, a, for example, A cannot speed, map to Cato. Okay, well, that. Then composition. Uh, okay. And map to uh, uh, speed. Uh, from C, we cannot see. Uh -huh. C. Okay, so what I heard is. Okay, there's this mapping and there's composition. And what has to happen is that in some sense, you know, you can either pose over here in the source category and then map, right? So so we think we compose F of G, the pair of F of G with F prime G prime, and we can map then having composed it in C cross C, we could then map that over, right? Um, and and what we would get is the, the map over of, of, of F prime, um, you know, this this guy right here. We could either compose them here, F and F prime, and then G and G prime, and then map it over. Um, it doesn't or, matter. We can exactly. Exactly. And map it over, or we can map these over to this tensor here of F and G, which I might write as F tensor G from now on. We'll but start. but um here we we haven't written an index here we've written a prefix um rather than f tensor g but I, from now on I'll often write f tensor g we could either map or we can map these over each of these and then compose here we have to get the same thing that's what we mean by honors it we either compose and map or we map and compose and we get the same thing do you, do you get that yeah. so this is what it means right like um. Uh, here we either the the latter the latter one is we compose, uh, and uh, so we compose f and f prime and g and g prime and then we map with tensor. Yeah. Or I'm starting to write an infix here, which will be my want um, for arithmetic. Or we or we map uh, f and g over. That's what this functor does, right? It maps it over over to that side, and then we compose. Do you see that? Yeah. Are we okay with this? Yeah. With this notion that honoring composition means you don't have to worry. They're the same. You don't have to worry about which one it is. And 
You don't have to worry about them being inconsistent. It's guaranteed to be the same. Do we, do we get this? Okay. We're, we're at the cusp of, 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 of greatness. We'll be able to understand some really good things if you can get that basic point, because this will come up a lot in the success of diagrams, wiring diagrams, and why we don't have to worry about certain visual elements. Okay. So I talked with you last time about monoidal categories. And the basic kind of idea is you have this bipon curve that maps over. You have what? What's another thing besides a functor for it to be a monoid? We need a lot. Begins with U, ends with T, yeah. and unit. Yeah. yeah. Um. That's right. It has a unit. Now this is defined here. Kind of. You may think it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's a functor from the category one. What is the category one? It's a category with just one object. It's it's a functor from that into C. What what's the job of that functor? What does it do in life? If you have a functor from the category one into another category, what's its sole job in life? It picks out the what? Picks out a single object in the target category. Do you, do you remember when we have sets and we have a singleton set and we map that? We have a, a function that maps that into another set. Um, in honor of Larissa, I'll say it's the set of elephant and um <laughs> and, and mastodon. Uh oh, okay. Um kind of the big pump produces. Husks and so on, and a and a, no, okay. So, do you remember when we map from a singleton set into any other set? How many of such? What's the job basically of this function? It basically does what in life? We map from a singleton set into another set. One unit. It, yeah, it it picks one of the. Elements of the final set. Remember that, and that's what this functor does: mapping from a single a, a category with a single object into another category. Well, the functor has to pick for that single object in the source category. This category one, just one object. It has to pick out what? What does a functor do? It maps objects to what? Objects. objects. So it picks out an object. So basically it's saying, hey, give me an object. Give me a monoidal object that serves as the unit. That's what that does. It just describes it as a map. Because we're in category theory, everything's about relations. We're not talking about individual objects. So it's kind of true to the spirit we specify as a, as a, as a monoid. Okay. Um, and it has to observe these properties. It's not just any old monoidal product and, 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 and unit. It has to have unitality, meaning if you combine that unit with any, you tensor it with any A with this functor, you get something isomorphic to A. And the same thing in the other direction. Okay. And we call this first one lambda, the isomorphism in that direction. We call the other one rho. And it, it, because of my thick skull, it took me a couple of years to realize, oh, lambda left unitary. Um, row, right unit term. And the associativity is called alpha. And it took me till um, yesterday to realize, <laughs> like, like, oh, that's like associativity. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, um, so anyway, the, the idea here is uh, the Greek letters to know what they're about. And this is associativity. So it's trying to say, look, if you, if you tensor A and B and then C, it's the same as as doing A and then tensoring A with tensor B and C. It's, it's well, yeah, it's, it's not. Um, and it turns out these come in three basic uh, levels, and one of them involves equality, one involves um, natural, what's called natural isomorphism. We won't, we won't get into the details of naturality, that will come soon in the book. And the other is natural transformations, which is even looser, it's a lax monoidal function. Um, so, uh, so, um, this is nice, and it turns out we can use that to define functors, but it has to have 
what are called coherence conditions. And I, I won't go into this in detail, but basically it says it's all very consistent in terms of uh, providing um, how these things play together nicely. You don't have to worry that if you go one way and reducing it, you get a different result in one with the other way. They all play together nicely. All the, all the diagrams, the pentagon diagram at the top and this triangle diagram at the bottom, they all can do. This one, it doesn't matter if you have A cross I cross B or A cross I cross B, it's the same as A cross B. You don't have to worry which way you go and you get a different result. No, 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 it's better behave than that. It's, it's, it's got nice properties, okay? Okay, now, that was monodal categories. Now, on to the new stuff. Um, so what's a symmetric monodal category? Symmetric monodal category is a monodal category with something extra that it observes. And can anyone spot? I've, I've kind of changed the typeface, but you know, may notice uh, lambda for left, right? R row for right unit, or right? Um, uh, associator. What's new here? Swap. Swap. You can flip it. Both either, either one. You can. Um, yeah. uh, and these are so these top three are they're called coherence conditions. They, they help guarantee it's it's really uh well uh sorry it says coherence. It's not, no no it's it's these these isomorphisms. It it has these coherence conditions uh, here. I'm sorry I said those coherence conditions. I don't think that's the technology. Okay, so now we're into the quite new stuff. So that was the definition. We added the swap thing. And it turns out it makes it so good. Okay. In terms of, of describing diagrams and many natural uses. So as is the norm in category theory, we try to find diagrams to help us capture our understanding and help us reason. The same thing is true in the system dynamics tradition, where it's very diagram centric. We reason about like why is the stock going up because inflow is greater than the outflow, right? We we reason about where the feedback loops are, et cetera. What's connected to what? What depends on what? It's all visual, and it's very aligned with, with this idea. So here, though, we we basically routinely, extensively use these language variously called wiring diagrams or string diagrams to describe these categories. When you do category theory, a lot of it is using pictures like this. So I'm going to introduce uh, these uh, components here. And um, here we're going to have uh, basic elements. So do you recognize what this is? This thing called eta here on the left? What is, what is that? Where did we see that before? Remember this? Yeah. This is yes, it's picking out a unit in X. Um, this is what is this doing? It's combining monoidally these sort of things together. It's 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 combining them. And and this is showing unitality. So, so unitality, you can say it's like this. This guy here represents the unit. And when you combine it with anything else, um, it's the same as just as just having a straight wire. So in other words, if you have a wire and you and you multiply it by the unit, I say multiply, tensor it with the unit, it's the same as just having that wire. You don't need this. This is like extra product. This, this, this uh stuff, this stuff here. Associativity is like this. You combine these two first and then this one. It's the same as combining uh, those latter two and then combining with the first. Uh, commutivity this is guess what that corresponds to? The what? Swap. A swap. You 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 have it like this, and then you get it like this, and it doesn't matter. And you you can swap them in either order, you know, and have it be symmetric. Hmm? And so you can you can kind of rub them around in, in either way. So this is from Seven Sketches, by the way, which is has, has lots of these diagrams. So I'm gonna I'm gonna build up 
uh, per seven sketches and um, per per the some wonderful the the, the associate lectures from Brendan Fong, brilliant he and David Spivak. Um, I'm going to build up this graphical language for these symmetric monodal categories these, of these wiring diagrams just for you. I'm going to show show it to you, but you can go back to this wonderful um, lecture if you're interested. So if we just have a line, it's identity. We're not doing anything to the thing I'm coming in on the line. We're not processing it. We're not mapping it. We're not transforming it. Are we okay with that? So it just transmits what's there, right? Doesn't change it. Okay, now. You may wonder how this related to this. Basically, we've blown up this little circle into something that looks more comforting for us as engineers. Um, so A and B kind of come together in this and they're processed by F. So, so F is a mapping from A tensor B. Now, now pay attention to this. A tensor B means they're, A and B are kind of in parallel. So they're being tensored. Um, uh, uh, together here to form C. So they're coming in in parallel uh, and they're being fed into F and that maps it to C, okay? Now, you might want to think about A and B sort of in a vertical slice here, as Brendan Polk says, um, and think, okay, this slice is A tensor B. It's sort of packaging them up you, you, you could be forgiven for thinking about it as like as a pair. They get packaged up by the tensor and fed into F as a, as a pair of them. And are we okay with that? So you kind of get fed in mm -hmm. to here. Um, and I'll come see. So it's a mapping from a tensor. You know, again, I'd like to think of it as kind of like a pair of them. Um, and it gets fed to C. Are we okay? When they're not in F. What's that? And they're mapping F. And mapping F. Yeah. Map, uh, map over. Yes. Okay. Now, this is serial composition. This is this is uh, sequential, would be a better word. Yeah. It's one after the other. So it's F, compose, then, then G. So it's we're composing successfully F and then G. And we use this big semicolon to say F. This is a case where it's kind of nice to write it in this order because it's kind of flowing from one to one. Are we okay with that? This is sequential mapping. We okay? Yeah. A on the mapping of F outcome B, B on the mapping yes. of G outcome B. Exactly. To come forward. That's right. Outcome Z. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, that's right. So uh, um, here we have F and G in parallel. They have A and B. Then F and G, they, they, A goes into F, B goes into G, and then we have A prime and B prime coming out. And the interpretation of this is F tensor G, like it. These are in parallel. So it's, it's again, it's kind of like we take the, the product of them. You have a pair, we both of them, right? And they're in, they're in parallel. Mind you, they're not sequential, which would be like composing them. If, you, if, you, if, if you're thinking back to that picture of the monoid, way the heck back, it's, good, it's with good reason, right? It's Remember, remember we, we composed, these are like composed here. This came from the compositional structure. Here, we're getting the ability to use the tensor structure. That's why we needed the, the monoidal structure. We, we want to be able to tensor them, put them next to each other. So now we can stick things together, not only sequentially, but also in parallel. And that's what the tensor is going to do. So when you think tensor, often you should think that, okay, they're, they're being combined in parallel. F is in, is in parallel with G. Do you see that? F is in parallel with G, right? Okay. So, so let's 
Let's go on to this. Okay, now, so, so this should start building up an understanding of this language. I submit to you, I argue to you that what we see here is F tensor G. What, why F tensor G on the left? Why do I say it's F tensor? They're in parallel. It's just like what we saw in the last one, right? F tensor G, do you see that? And then, why, why this? Yeah, it's, it's sequential. It's, it's, this is composition with A. Now, the thing that might stick in your craw, um, and I, I understand is that you might say, well, wait, wait a minute, there's these two lines from F cross G going in there. But remember, we can think almost, I, can, I think of F cross G as kind of packaging them together and they then flow into A. So yeah, H takes both of them, it takes the package of both of them together, these two lines, okay? Sticks, sticks in into there. It's, you can think of it as A, A prime, B prime tensor with each other going into H, right? Um, so so it's it's sucking in these two things. It expects like the package from an approach. That's why. No. Okay. Um okay, so now we can we can also have, I mean, don't don't be caught up that that everything has to be can only take one input. We could have these two, A tensor B feeding into F, which then outputs C tensor D, and which feeds into G, and G happens to output one thing. That's okay. It's okay. Um, F can output a tensor of things, and G can input a, a tensor of things, just like we had here, right? Uh, H input a, a tensor of things, okay? In other words, it inputs things in parallel, right? These wires into it in parallel. Are we okay with this? This a G inputs these wires in parallel. A, a inputs these wires in parallel. Um, okay. Um, and similarly, you could you could you could do this. So you, you have these F and G. They can take different different numbers of inputs and put out different numbers of outputs. Are we okay? Okay. Now, what's that? Did, were you going to say something? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, um, in the previous, in the yeah. Previous picture, yeah, because it's F first and then G, right? Like G is taking the output of F, it's sequential. A tensor B is, is you're right, A and B are in parallel. You can think of this as A tensor B. Why we haven't, we haven't. Well, because there's no processing going on here, so we don't even write it, but it's like ID. It's like, remember, wires like ID, right? It's like ID cross ID or ID tensor ID. And F expects two things. It's kind of a package of two things. And G and it outputs two things, and G expects that. And so it gets, G just takes the package of two that are output by F here. The tensor of them, so we don't even have to write it. Okay, um, it is true we could write, you know, ID cross ID ID cross ID, and you know, feed them into each other, but it wouldn't add a lot of um, uh, a lot of understanding. But now I want now this this sort of realization is going to start sinking in about remember this idea that you can either. Tensor first and then compose, or you can compose first and then tensor. Remember that idea? Remember, tensor means parallel first and then and then serial, or serial um, for each piece and then and then tensor by composing. Okay, so suppose we have this. I would argue that this has two, and, and again, it's it's drawing directly on Brendan Fong's composition, which I recommend. Um, uh, you know the math coming from the master, but here, um, what do we? What are two visual interpretations? Can anyone give me one visual interpretation or one interpretation for this using the sort of language we've come up? Okay, F F tensor S, yeah. and then what? G tensor. Okay, and what between them? So F tensor F. Come. 
and then compose with G tensor T. Are, are we okay with that? So we, we tensor these to reflect the fact they're in parallel. We, we have a tensor of G and T, but, but, but that's after F and G's time. And so, so there's a compose with a fat semi. Are we okay with that? Okay. Okay. Um, and what's another one? What's another interpretation? We we can uh, we can uh, write another one but because the it doesn't matter to tensor. That's right. Oh, we can compose and after that. Okay, what would the compose and then tensor be like? If compose G. Yeah. Tensor. Yes. If compose T. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Those are two alternative ways. So one is F compose G from sequence, right? Tensor because why the tensor? In because it's in parallel with F composite T, right? That that's one perfectly consistent, perfectly reasonable. The other interpretation, which we said first, was F tensor S composed with G tensor T, right? Perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Those are the same. They are the same. And they are guaranteed to be the same because of this. They mean the same thing. They give identical results. It doesn't matter which one you read it as. Whatever is your preference, whatever you find actual, whatever you find convenient for the circumstances, whatever you find helpful to explain it, whatever you find you know, uh, intuitive given the layout, right? Maybe if the F were in the middle here, it would be easier to read as F, you know, composed with G tensor S T because you don't have to worry about what's vertically with what. Whatever the preference, whatever your intuition is best at, you can use, but you have the extra degree of confidence, sureness, and, um, you know, uh, safety of knowing that these two are the same. There's no, there's no ambiguity that matters, right? There's a distinction with uh, without a real difference here, right? Um, okay, how about here? What are two visual interpretations of this? Okay, any, I, I, you're, you're doing awesome. We'll make sure someone else's voice gets heard. Okay. Mm. So what are two possible interpretations of, of this? Remember, empty wires are identity, right? Um, okay, does someone else want to say something? Try venture or something? That's one great interpretation. Perfectly good interpretation. What's another possible interpretation? Another one. If uh, compose H uh -huh. and G compose H and uh, between tensor. And then, so yeah, that would, um, so somehow you're going to need to, so F tensor H, like, uh, uh, composed, okay. Um, tensor, you're saying G, uh, composed H. I believe that would be correct as feeding into H. But there's actually another one yet, I'm thinking. That's, that's maybe you, you would criticize, but F tensor ID, right? What, where'd the ID come from? It's a wire, right? So F tensor ID composed with, what's this next one? Where'd that come from? IVG. Yeah, IVG. So it's yeah. it's this wire with G, right? Because like that wire, it's it's just another, you know, um, identity, right? It's, it's it's another identity composed with H. H here is 
waiting for a tensor of things, and it's going to suck it in. You told, and, you told me a few minutes ago that it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, it, it doesn't need to write. Five. You don't have to, you but I'm just saying you can do it. Oh. What, what I'm trying to express is you don't have to, but you can. And, and I said that you could do it every middle line you can say ID cross ID, I, you know, ID tensor ID, ID tensor ID, because but it doesn't the, change anything. Yeah, because of the because uh, of the uh, this, I didn't think about the I there. Yeah. yeah, so so you can do it. Yeah. And if you if you find that natural, um maybe you're doing one at a time, you don't know what's next and and so you just do this for this block, and then you do this for this block. And, but these are two different interpretations, but they are the same. They're not different in their implications. They give the same result. Do you get that? Okay. Um, okay, so this is, this is a more sophisticated one. This one actually takes a lot of thinking. Um, let's try to parse out the first of them. Um, where does this ID cross F come from? Mm -hmm. The first one. X. Yeah. X is, is um, I'm sorry, but I, yeah. ID, uh, ID the tensor F is from, this is ID is just the water mm -hmm. tensor with F. Are we okay with that? Yeah. And then G tensor H in parallel. in parallel because they're and they're taking the results of this first one, right? Um, and and G tensor H and then K because it's sequential, the results of this are being fed on. Now, this one is more subtle because you know, like you have F output, not just going to G. It's actually kind of splitting here, and 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 you you can kind of see some, uh, you know, again some subtlety in the so that's equivalent to F tensor G. This is reminding me of what Nesteron was saying. F tensor G here and F composed with H. So F, 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 um, F and G and F and H in parallel uh, because we have F going to C kind of in parallel with F, H. And you notice F is written twice here. And this is what you were saying earlier as a possibility with that A, with that earlier, you know, that you'll be written A twice. And I said, yes, I think that's correct. And then K because that finishes. So um, what we have here is a language that is by design eliminates worrying about ambiguities. It eliminates um, needing to make uh, distinctions uh, that that really are naturally processed visually is the same. Naturally, visually ambiguous things are no different in the math. And that's what comes with symmetric monodal categories. Um, and you can have wires crossing and going to different uh, inputs or what have you. You don't want them in all cases, but they come up in a lot of cases. And one thing you get here very much is taking these diagrams as a whole and composing them together. Uh, sticking them together. <laughs> and if this is starting to remind you a little bit of this idea of composing stock flow models, it's with good reason that, you know, this, this whole idea of having diagrams with clear mathematical underpinnings and, and meanings, and uh, they can then be stuck together. They have clear mathematical syntax associated with them that allows you to mathematically join them together into larger units. And as we'll see with the polynomial functors context, uh, outside the scope of this course, um, you can nest these diagrams successively. Uh, you can, um, and, and one way to put them is end to end, but another way, you notice it's going on here, that we are taking this diagram in the left 
and we're sticking it into, that's why it says composition with one into one here and it gets expanded. Do you see that? So this is, this is a notion of composition that maybe will be less familiar to you. Here we've been dealing with composition that's kind of, um, you know, one feeds in laterally to the other downstream, upstream composition. And that is a type of composition that's very common. But another form of composition that's incredibly common and incredibly um, intuitive and well-supported is hierarchical composition. And those of you looking for, you know, to look at the papers and to kind of, um, um, to, to find topics might be of interest, for example, is this paper wiring diagrams as normal forms, kind of these, this, um, uh, sort of uh, excellent modeling language is this exemplary modeling language for computing. And here we have one diagram being composed with another by expanding a piece of it hierarchically. So we have an overall diagram. That's what these wiring diagrams support. Yes, Nastra. Uh, yes, that's brilliant, actually. That's exactly right, that we might take a causal loop structure that's more detailed, put it into a more coarse grain structure and expand in this, right? Um, and expand in that. And one thing that Eric's aware of, but we've also done it for stop flow diagrams, where, yeah, so like we might have an SIR model. This is what Nicholas Meadows uh, put into place, you know, an SIR model, SIR, and then maybe separately, we have a, a, a sub-model that characterizes the different types of I. Well, there's, you know, um, infected people in the community who are still mixing, there's infected people who are isolated, and there's infected people in the hospital, and uh, we will expand this I stop with this sub diagram to have, you know, a, an expanded diagram. And this is a very common need. You could imagine it also for block diagrams in engineering or electrical situations where we expand, you know, we have a, a modular unit, which we plug in, maybe it's an arithmetic logic unit. We plug it into our circuit, we use it as a whole um, in this circuit uh, diagram. But then in another beat, we sort of expand it so we could see how all its components interconnect. Very, very common need, directly supported mathematically by, by these sort of symmetric wiring, um, uh, symmetric monoidal categories as the basis for these wiring diagrams. And we'll see it uh, in spades with polynomial functions. You can go down sort of to, uh, uh, to deeper and deeper levels. <laughs> Um, so symmetric monodal categories, uh, the video helped expose you to the fact that there's all these different languages in physics and engineering, and natural sciences, you know, earth, earth systems, and ecology, et cetera, that have a logic to them, that have compositionality and that have uh, parallel uh, structure, et cetera. And symmetric monodal categories provide this key to unlock this ability to reason about these diagrams with consistency, without worrying about possible visual ambiguities. And I know it seems, you know, three steps removed, but it turns out that these rules and uh, the fact things are associative, the fact that that you can combine either way with the unit, et cetera. In fact, you can swap. Just uh, makes reading those diagrams, um, you know, very, very, uh, uh, very, very intuitive. It means you don't have to worry about um, a lot of uh, not unnecessary detail in the layout, et cetera. Um, you can uh, you can read it as you see fit, and know that it's it comes to the same interpretation. Okay, so that's symmetric monoidal categories. And they serve as a jumping off point 
for lots of areas, including in stochastics and probabil uh, probabilistic systems, uh, for soft flow diagrams, algebraic pet free, uh, and uh, for uh, electrical circuits, uh, uh, block diagrams of these circuits, et cetera. Chapter seven sketches, chapter six shows this applied to um, electrical circuits. And it's quite cool. And you'll see push outs there. You'll see push outs come back because you have push outs between these uh, what are called cosmics. Okay, mm -hmm. I think. Um, we're we're at time today. I, I hope that's been uh, of interest to you, and um, uh, it it certainly will lay the groundwork for our discussion of uh, polynomial functors.